So, so uh, thank you, uh, Jim. We have all uh, been reading the last five years about the horrors of the war in Syria. Today, we have an unusual opportunity and a, a painful opportunity to hear firsthand eyewitness accounts of what those horrors have been like from someone who lived through them. Uh, Aram al damuni is a Syrian who lives in the area of East Ghouta, east of Damascus. He has been a Syrian activist trying to change his country since 2000. His father before him was an activist who was killed in a Syrian prison. And translating Aram's comments is Mohammed Ghanem, who is the Director of Government Relations for the Syrian American Council, uh, an important organization in Washington, who travels often in Syria, uh, talking with people in these local areas, local councils, and so has also seen this firsthand. And he'll translate Aram's comments. I want to just set the scene. Aram's town of East Ghouta has been a key battlefield in this war. It had been under siege from the Syrian regime forces of Bashar al-Assad for about three years when the events that we're now going to describe began. So people uh, were uh, emaciated, uh, struggling with their health already. And I now want to ask Aram to begin the narrative by telling us what happened on the day of August 21st 2013. الذي حصل في بتاريخ 21 أغسطس 2013 تم استهداف أحد مدن الغوطة الشرقية مدينة صقبة ب 13 صاروخ محملين برؤوس كيميائية غاز السارين. What what transpired on August 21st 2013 was that one of the towns of eastern Ghouta was targeted with about 13 uh, chemical-laden rockets. So what, and what were you doing when this began? Where, 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 this was late at night, yes? Where were you when you <laughs> when it happened? I was in the middle of the middle of the middle of the I was in eastern Ghouta, in Duma, about two kilometers from uh, the impact site in Saqba. And, and so, uh, as you described it to me earlier, you, you walked out your door and you saw something startling that you'd never seen before. Describe what you saw. About 2 a.m. Uh, we, about 2 a.m., we got mayday calls, an alarm, mayday calls from uh, Saqba. Uh, that dozens of civilians uh, were unconscious. Uh, so, so we headed straight to, to Saqba, and to uh, our surprise, we found out that there were uh, dozens of bodies strewn across the streets. Strewn across the streets. We didn't know if they were if they just passed out, or if they were dead or injured. Um, be, be, and uh, because there were no signs of there were, there were no wounds or signs of bleeding. Uh, which was unusual because most of those who get injured in Ghouta, you know, that happens because of shelling and bombardment. So we went to the medical points. And there we saw tens of, uh, of similar cases. Some of those injured were uh, rushed to Duma because Duma was not was not targeted that day. And 
من المصابين. So we, we, we had to deal with hundreds of cases of people who had fallen unconscious, and injured. We didn't know what was going on. I want, Aram, I want to ask you so that people can see with your eyes what, what you saw when you first came out at 2 a.m. Were these people, the, the bodies lying in the street, uh, unconscious, were these, were these fighters who'd been involved in the fight, or were they simple civilians? Uh, عندما توجهنا إلى مدينة صقبة وجدنا المصابين الضحايا والمصابين معظمهم من النساء والأطفال. Actually, when we went, uh, when we rushed to Saqba, we realized that uh, overwhelming majority of victims were civilians, mostly women and children. معظم الضحايا وجدناهم داخل البيوت. Because most of them actually were targeted in, inside their houses. Uh, داخل غرفهم كانوا نائمين. Inside their bedrooms, some of them were sleeping. Uh, لم يستيقظوا أو لم يشعروا بأي شيء. So they, they, I think they didn't feel anything because they, you know, that happened during their sleep. استنشقوا غاز السارين وهم so نائمون. They, و... they inhaled sarin when they were sleeping. و لا لم لم يستطع أحد إنقاذهم. And no one, no one could could uh, so save them. Rescue just so them. we understand what this image is, we had sleeping women and children yeah. at two in the morning, attacked by bombardment shells with sarin gas that have the effect of suffocating them. They stagger outdoors into the street, and Aram encounters them. And at that point, in the beginning, you didn't know what was wrong with them. At first blush, we didn't know what, what was uh, happening. Because that was the first time we had uh, ever seen anything like this. بسبب أيضا عدد المصابين العدد الكبير أكثر من خمستاش ألف مصاب. And because of the overwhelming number of those who reported with with symptoms about fifteen thousand people. فكنا بحالة تخبط. We were in a, it was a, it was the scene was chaotic. ومنها أيضا بسبب إصابة الكوادر الطبية والمسعفين. And what actually complicated things further was that medical some medical crew members were uh, uh, you know uh, were also impacted because through exposure to th those who were. Uh, targeted with, with sarin gas. Which actually uh, pushed some civilians to just head aimlessly uh, towards any medical centers they, they or medical points or facilities they could uh, uh, find. But because of the magnitude of the shock, وعدم وإصابة الكوادر الطبية والمصرفين في تلك المنطقة. And because medical crew members were actually, they also became secondhand victims. لم يستطع أحد إسعافهم إلى النقاط الطبية البعيدة. Lots of people, lots of people couldn't be rescued or rushed to medical facilities. So you were one of the medical people who were helping the victims. And you must have been exposed yourself to this gas. I think this audience would be interested to know that in the years after this attack in 2013, you and thousands of others had uh, secondary co consequences. I went, so I rushed to Saqba when we first learned about the attack as a media activist because we wanted to cover what was happening. بسبب عدد المصابين الكبير. But because the number of casualties was overwhelming. واستهداف المشافي الميدانية في المنطقة. And because uh, the the chemical attack was actually followed up with uh, attacks on medical facilities in Ghouta, in Saqba. من الجانب الإنساني أنا وغيري من الإعلاميين قمنا بإسعاف المصابين. So it was a humanitarian imperative on me and other media activists to actually try and help. With what was going on. في الذكرى الأولى لمجزرة الكيمياوي. On the first anniversary of the the chemical attack. في عام 2014. قمنا بجولة إعلامية في في ذكرى هذه المجزرة في مدينة صقبة وعين ترما. On on the first anniversary of the chemical attacks, we actually did some reporting. 
ان صقبه ان عين ترما ف يعني تو مارك ذا انيفرسري المصابين هناك عوارض جانبيه حصلت لهم بعد عام سو وي وي كونتاكتد ا تور اند وي ريلايز ذات سم اوف ذوز فيكتيمز وير ستيل سفرين فروم سيمتمز A year after the attack. من هذه الأعراض فقدان الذاكرة. Some had lapse of memory. ضيق في التنفس. Shortness of breath. وأوجاع في العين. And I pain. I pain. وأنا أحد الأشخاص تعرضت لغاز السارين. I was one of those. I was one of those. مية قليلة. I was one of those who were exposed to sarin, but it was a it was a small amount. وبعد ثلاث سنين أعاني من ضيق من التنفس. Even even though I was exposed to a tiny amount, three years after that happened, I still suffer from some symptoms such as مثل شو. ضيق التنفس. Such as shortness of breath. Just so that we remind ourselves, we're talking about sarin nerve gas. One of the most deadly gases that's been used. One of the most toxic chemical agents that the U.S. and other countries have have sought to ban. On the night that Aram is describing and the surrounding time, it's believed that 1,400 people, mostly women and children, were killed in the town where he lives. In addition, the the people who suffered. After. So I want to ask Aram whether before that attack you had ever heard about a statement from our president that any use of chemical weapons by the Syrian regime would be crossing a red line. طبعا احنا من قبل استخدام السلاح الكيميائي كنا نسمع تصريحات منذ ايام هيلاري كلينتون عندما كانت وزيرة الخارجية في الإدارة الأمريكية على الأسد أن يتنحى لا يوجد دور الأسد في مستقبل سوريا هناك خطوط حمراء عدم استهداف المدنيين ولكن الأسد كان دائما بعد كل تصريح للإدارة الأمريكية يحدث مجزرة يقتل العشرات من المدنيين وأخي يعني ومنها قتل أكثر من 1400 مدني وأكثر من 15000 مصاب بغاز سارين. So before before the uh, chemical attacks happened, we used to hear statements coming out of Washington D.C. such as, uh, you know, from from Secretary Clinton, who was at the time Secretary of State, that uh, you know that they had red lines in Syria, that uh, that the regime should not have crossed, that Assad had to step down, that he had to step aside, that Assad had no role to play in, in future Syria, that use of chemical uh, gases would be, uh, if, that if the regime deployed chemical gases, that would be crossing of, of, a, of a red line. Uh, so we, we, we were uh, uh, familiar and aware of those uh, statements coming uh, from, from the United States. Uh, but after, uh, what, ha what actually happened was that after uh, every, uh, sta so every statement that was made, the regime actually committed a massacre and those massacres, massacres culminated with the slaughter of 1,400 people uh, on, on, the, on the night the chemical attacks happened, which also uh, involved thousands of uh, uh, thousands of people were injured and 1,400 people were killed. بعد استخدام غاز السارين وتم استخدام غاز آخر وهو غاز الكلور. And after sarin was used, another gas was deployed, which is chlorine gas. ولكن نحن كشعب سوري ليست المشكلة هي باستخدام غاز السارين أو أو مواد أو أسلحة محرمة دوليا هناك أسلحة أخرى أيضا يقتل بها الشعب السوري الفسفور. For us, for us, as far as you know, as Syrians are concerned, for us it's not just about you know how you kill us and you know whether or not you use internationally banned. Uh, uh, weapons such as such as sarin. Uh, there are other weapons uh, that are that have been deployed and employed by the regime to kill us, such as white phosphorus, custom munitions that were used in uh, against uh, Eastern Ghouta. هل تعلم سيدي بأن هناك عند خلال الأربعة أشهر الماضية عند اتفاق على وقف إطلاق النار برعاية أمريكية روسية. 
تم حدوث أكثر من 23 مجزرة في الغوطة الشرقية راح ضحيتها أكثر من 350 sir, شهيد Sir, do you actually know that since the so-called cessation of hostilities was announced just in Ghouta, eastern Ghouta alone uh, more than 23 massacres have been committed resulting in more than 350 uh, 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 casualties uh, among civilians I would just note, since this audience, uh, I'm sure, is aware that after this uh, attack in 2013 and the president's decision not to launch military strikes, an agreement was made to remove Syrian uh, chemical weapons jointly with Russian supervision. The Syrian American Medical Society uh, recently published a report saying that chemical weapons attacks have continued so frequently that they are, in the words of this group, the new normal. They counted 65 attacks with chlorine gas last year alone. That is in the year after all chemical weapons supposedly had been removed from Syria. So this is, uh, there's always a chance to draw another uh, red line. Um, I want to uh, ask uh, Aram, uh, because this is such a, a painful story, there's another part of his life that I think people would be interested in, uh, in which uh, Syrians are trying to build local governance in the areas that they control uh, and make some kind of uh, governance work. And maybe, Aram, you could tell us about the local councils that are operating uh, in East, East Ghouta and in, in other areas, what they're doing and how you're trying to pick up the pieces after this uh, disaster. Uh, after we liberated towns in Eastern Ghouta from the Assad regime, we established local councils. النظام السوري بعد تحرير الغوطة الشرقية قام باستهداف البنية التحتية. After Assad lost control of Eastern Ghouta, Assad started targeting the infrastructure in uh, in areas that were not under his control. لا يوجد في الغوطة الشرقية لا كهرباء. As a result, we we don't have uh, 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 you know the power was killed. ولا مواد طاقة. And no no uh, you know fuel. ولا مياه صالحة للشرب. No, you know, drinking water. قمنا بتأسيس هذه المجالس المحلية للتخدم المدنيين. So we established these local councils to try and provide some of those services and provide those services to civilians. وتوفير المواد اللازمة لاستكمال الحياة في الغوطة الشرقية. And to secure these these basic necessities so life could go on in Eastern Ghouta. الغوطة الشرقية محاصرة منذ أكثر من ثلاث سنوات. Eastern Ghouta has been under siege for more than three years now. لا يدخل لا يدخل إليها لا دواء Nothing in and out, including medicine, medications, uh, food. خلال عام واحد راح ضحية الحصار أكثر من خمسمائة قتيل. Without within one year only, more than 500 people starved to death as a result of the siege. حالة إنسانية مأساة حقيقية. So the humanitarian situation in Ghouta is really catastrophic. It's a humanitarian tragedy. قمنا بمناشدة المجتمع الدولي والأمم المتحدة. We pleaded with the international community and the United Nations. دخلت أول مرة تدخل يدخل إلينا وفد من الأمم المتحدة برئاسة الدكتور يعقوب الحلو. So the first time a UN delegation actually made it into Ghouta, it was that UN delegation was headed by headed up by a UN officer by the name of Yaqub Al Hulu. قاموا بإدخال عدد من الشاحنات التي لا تكفي واحد بالمئة من عدد السكان الأصليين في الغوطة الشرقية. So they 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 uh, they brought in some uh, some trucks with them, but those trucks were not uh, uh, were not uh, were not even sufficient for one percent. Of of uh, those living under siege in Ghouta. في الغوطة الشرقية خمسمائة ألف مدني. About five hundred thousand people live in Ghouta. يعانون من نقص الغذاء والدواء. Suffer from lack of food, medicine. ويتقوم المجالس المحلية. So those local councils try to meet uh, these needs. بتأمين هذه الاحتياجات عن طريق بعض المشاريع البسيطة. Uh, so these local councils try to meet some of those needs through basic. 
initiatives. Such as uh, um, you know raising uh, uh, crops in on some farmland. Such, such as weed, vegetables. Because Ghouta was uh, uh, the Ghouta was arable land and it was was farmland. بعد أن وثقنا هناك حالة إنسانية خطيرة الآن في هذه الأيام تعاني منها الغوطة الشرقية. قمنا ووثقنا بمبادرة الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية بوقف إطلاق النار. Due to the grave humanitarian situation in Ghouta, we actually placed hopes and 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 trusted the. Uh, the recent diplomatic arrangement in Syria. I think he means the cessation of hostilities. But neither the regime nor Russia, uh, neither the regime nor Russia nor Iran actually abided by the terms of the, uh, the cessation of hostilities. They actually escalated. وعدم وجود الحماية الدولية. and there was no there was no measures for protecting civilians. وعدم وجود مراقب دولي لعملية توقف الصراع. there was no there were no international monitors to actually observe the cessation on the ground and 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 enforce enforce it. سيطرة القوات السورية. والقوات الإيرانية بمساعدة طيران الجو الحربي الروسي. So during the ceasefire, the 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 Assad regime forces actually seized territory in Ghouta with the support of of Russian and regime air forces. سيطروا على الآلاف من الدنمات الزراعية. So they they control they they captured thousands of of farm hectares. في المنطقة الجنوبية وهي تعتبر الخزان الغذائي الرئيسي للمدنيين في الغوطة الشرقية. Although this was the area that they got to capture during the ceasefire was our food basket. This is again this is after the the cessation of of hostilities. So unfortunately, the time allotted for this session has ended. This is. Syria is an abstraction for all of us. It is a, a word that comes up almost every day in our presidential campaign. It's very unusual to be able to hear someone describe this not as an abstraction, but it's some, as something he lived through. So please join me in thanking him and all the people he worked with. Let you get by. So, Ruba Mahesan uh, is an economist, activist, and development practitioner who works on development issues in the Middle East and North Africa, particularly forced migration and the Syrian refugee crisis. She's a founder and director of Sawa Foundation and Sawa for Development Aid, civil society organization that's working with Syrian refugees on an integrated approach to development since 2011, and she's in the red in the middle. Alina Sergei Artar is a co-founder and CEO of Karam Foundation, a Syrian-American architect and writer from Aleppo. She co-developed the foundation's innovative education initiatives and leadership program and travels to the Syria-Turkey border to run its smart aid programs. Uh, and finally, on, on the end in the blue shirt is Killian uh, Kleinschmidt, an international networker, humanitarian, and refugee expert. He has experience in a wide range of countries, emergencies, and refugee camps as a United Nations official, aid worker, and diplomat. I think it was the New York Times said that, that uh, his bio reads like a Wikipedia entry for international aid development over the last 30 years. Uh, Kleinschmidt managed the refugee camp at uh, Zatari in Jordan from 2013 to 2014 as is the founder and chairman of the Startup Innovation and Planning Agency. So as I walk up there, let me just start by uh, asking a question. Uh, in our brief 25-minute session, I would first like to frame the issue. How did we get here, and why is the Syrian conflict different than previous international uh, crises? Uh, what is different than what we have seen in the past? Why don't we? Um, okay. Sure. Um, well, thank you very much for having us. Um, the Aram's testimony right now is very powerful. As a Syrian American from Aleppo, um, seeing this audience that came to 
hear about Syria um, from Syrians is very, very moving after five and a half years of feeling very abandoned by the world. So I thank you all for coming and listening to people like Aram and the voices that you'll hear today. Um, I'm from Aleppo, and to add to what Aram said, um, my city, which is the oldest continuously inhabited city in the world, it's the world of all of our humanity, the city of all of our humanity has been destroyed over the past five and a half years, and in the last few weeks, it has been bombed every single day by Russian air forces with phosphorus bombs, every night. We wake up in the morning and we watch fire bombs descending on our city and uh, on in northern Syria. So to answer your question, this is not a natural disaster. People are not starving in Syria because there's a famine. This is a man-made conflict, has man-made solutions, and nobody wants to stop the war. I think that it's a huge um, tragedy in the refugee crisis that we, divo we want to divorce refugees from the political state on the ground, and you can't do that. Syrian refugees exist because of the world's failure to stop the war, and as long as bombs are falling on Syrians, the refugee crisis is going to continue to escalate. So we need to end the war, end the violence, protect civilians first in order to begin to talk about how do you solve the refugee refugee crisis. Uh, Ruba? Um, first of all, I think it's very important to remember that although every crisis is relative, we need to remember that Syrians before the war were not living in a fragile state or in a you know, uh, country that was susceptible to war. Uh, the refugee crisis is different in Syria than a lot of other countries because in the camps today, you find a lot of people with university degrees, you find lawyers, you find me uh, medical people who have been uh, you know, forced to leave their homes. One of our volunteers met her piano teacher um, in one of the camps, uh, freezing uh, in one of the camps in the Bekaa Valley. So just to give you uh, an example, uh, the main problem is that the world woke up to the refugee crisis and everyone started to invite us to speak about it, to speak about the 2015 refugee crisis, just because it had just hit the shores of Europe. However, the refugee crisis had started in 2011, but because it was somewhere far away, no one was actually uh, looking at it as a crisis. So, uh, I mean, this is why uh, it's, it's a very different crisis than, than a lot of the crises before. The third and final point that I want to make on this question is that this is a different crisis because Syrians, since day one, have been extending their arms to the world. Um, they have been calling out for a no-fly zone, for a protection of civilians. They have been offering solutions. Not a single Syrian wants to be on a boat going to Europe. Not a single refugee wants to be in refugee camps. And you will be surprised. I've been working in refugee camps since 2011. And even though the situation inside Syria is getting worse and worse, there are still Syrians that are leaving the refugee camps in Lebanon and going back into Syria, preferring to live in their own country than to live in refugee camps or to go to Europe where they don't even speak the language. So this is really a community that wants to be home, wants to be safe home, and doesn't want to be in other, any other place uh, in the world except Syria. Yeah, yeah uh, the crisis has been um, different because, of course, it's one of the largest movements of population since the Second World War. Um, one million people last year showed us that they had enough of the world being ignorant of what's going on out there. And in fact, they spoke for the 65 million war displaced and refugees in the world. They actually brought us in the world to understand that our tolerance and our acceptance of other people is not that far. Of course, that Europe is not yet the peace project that we believed it to be. And, and this is something which is very dear to me, that aid, as we design aid today, still as we did after the Second World War, is a failure. We need to rethink aid, and it's totally unacceptable that five years after the beginning of a war, we a, not even managing to feed people properly. Uh, secondly, that we don't respect that they don't want just survival aid, that they want perspectives, that they want education, jobs. They don't want to be dependent on, um, on charity. 
And it is absolutely shameful that five years later, we have not built up new ways of providing support to uh, populations in distress. So that's a perfect segue into sort of where we wanted to go with this conversation. And I'm going to go back to you, Kevin, uh, and then come back along the line. But um, so clearly, on its own terms, it's not working. Uh, aid is not meeting the needs of the people that it's trying to serve. It is also woefully underfunded, according to the United Nations in their latest appeal of all the different organizations. Only about 25 percent of the of the budgets have been met, um, and that's that stands true for this year as well. Even though donors earlier this year pledged 6.6 billion dollars. Uh, you shrug, but that's exactly true. Uh, and, and so, Killian, I, how can we innovate? How, how, what can we be doing differently? Right, first of all, everybody needs to understand the United Nations, the aid agencies, they don't have any money. So they depend on donations by states. The cake for all crises in the world for emergency response is $20 billion a year, roughly. Again, that's peanuts. It's ridiculous. Lots of people here and to business, they know what $20, million, uh, $20 billion mean today. That's one. For the crisis in Syria, despite all the attention and our, well, alleged uh, in interest in this crisis, last year only 62% of the appeal for humanitarian aid was actually funded. But we need to move away from the whole concept of here there are people that want our charity. We need to move into, into recognizing that uh, many of these populations, let me speak about the refugees and the surrounding countries of Syria, hitting very poor areas in countries which have their own tremendous problems. We haven't been investing in those countries. So poor populations meeting poor populations, poor plus poor is double poor. And uh, that is actually happening in this, in this region. We haven't invested significantly as we should have done into water, which is one of the big issues in the region, into energy, other things. So get away from that whole concept there are um, refugees, they need tents and survival aid, and that's it. Let's move into understanding that in fact here we have major population shifts and they need to be um, addressed in a totally different logic. And here business plays a very big role, knowledge of the world plays a very big role, bringing in the capacities of mayors of the world into communities, into municipalities which are suddenly facing double populations. Let's be clear, that is, uh, that is how innovation should look like. Uh, just if I can t take one figure, the mayor of the Hook in northern Iraq, in, in the Kurdish region of northern Iraq, he had 700,000 inhabitants four years ago. Now he, had, he has 1.4 million to deal with. So answers, how do we innovate? Well, and I think that's a really important point, too. It's, it's not just the refugees themselves, but it's their host communities that are also stressed. And so when we think about it, we, we need to think about it in a holistic manner. Ruba, as a, as a, as a leader of, of, of a local NGO, uh, I think the importance of those organizations are really critical as well. Maybe you could draw that out a yes, little bit. Yes, just, uh, just to support uh, Kilian's point, I'm half Lebanese, half Syrian, and Lebanon is a country of four and a half million people. It's currently hosting more than two million Syrian refugees. So just think about it. Um, just to go back to your point about the 6.6 .6 billion, uh, those are figures that are statements of intent. Those are not actual figures. Uh, th those, those were pledged, but they weren't actually uh, met yet. Uh, to put things into perspective, let's say there is uh, $2 million that, uh, I'm, I'm just using a small figure just for, for example purposes. Let's say the German government gets $2 million. Uh, it, it, it contracts uh, a German organization in Germany, uh, GIZ, they receive $1.8 million. They give it to GIZ Middle East that uh, get uh, 1.6. Of course, all the bureaucratic costs are going down the line. Then they, the, the, the money is received by GIZ, who then gives Save the Children, Oxfam, uh, et cetera, small portions of this. And then, um, you know, one of these INGOs open uh, funding for an organization like us, which is doing the bulk of the work, and be like, 35K, you know, go ahead and apply. This is literally what's happening uh, in the aid system. And not only that, we are not allowed to, uh, uh, in most times, uh, fund our own core costs, uh, which is to support the staff in the organization that I manage. 95% of the people who work in the organizations are actually Syrians from the communities, because those are people with a lot of skills, 
with a lot of dreams, with a lot of cap cap capabilities. Uh, so uh, we need to look at these people as a huge resource. You know, it's always being said that every problem is a, is a huge opportunity. And I really, uh, really believe in that. Uh, we are uh, working with refugees to train them as teachers, uh, you know, as bus drivers, as animators, as music animators, uh, technological uh, p uh, animators. We, you need to trust the local. People need to take a leap of faith in trusting the local, trusting how they, uh, you know, uh, uh, strategize for their own development, I mean, just to give you a small example, the Kuwaiti government, uh, along with the UN, did a huge project that costs millions of dollars uh, to just put uh, plac placards in, in, in the camps, uh, teaching uh, people in three easy steps how to wash their hands. These people came from Syria, which is a very water-abundant country, and they knew exactly how to wash their hands. But this is because these agencies have not contextualized programs that are set by people who are living in bubbles, rather than really uh, talking to the locals and asking them what is needed and how can we serve you rather than just continue doing our programs which we've implemented in Africa and Latin America and other places. So Lena, your, your organization we were laughing about it this morning has been called a disruptor yes. uh, in, the, in the delivery of, of these type of assistance. How has it been disruptive and how, how do you see innovation? Well, we started from a very simple concept, which is from the point of view of distributing humanitarian aid in a conflict zone, which we actually had to learn on the fly because conflict came to our homeland, which is a very simple thing that we were shocked to find that aid agencies actually don't do, is to ask people what they need. And we start from that point, and that's what we do. We go, and, and these needs change from geographically. They change from season to season. They change as refugee children are growing older. And so we're focused on, cre on, on delivering this, what we call smart aid, which is community-driven aid. And we do innovative education for Syrian refugee youth. We are determined to build a better future for Syria, no matter, despite whatever happens. Um, and whatever the, the world wants to do to help Syrians or the situation on the ground, we are invested in the youth of Syria. And the best way to invest in the youth is to invest in their education. Uh, we spend a lot of time with Syrian refugee teens, both boys and girls. And we deliver workshops in technology, coding, entrepreneurship, arts, sports, literary arts. And you would be amazed by how these kids want, to, they want, they want a better future for themselves. When we, you open them up to the world, you connect them online, you build computer labs in their schools, which they take care of so well, they, they decide to, to, to reach out for that future. So we're getting kids into scholarships. Um, we actually have four Syrian refugee youth that are in the United States that we got them accepted to go. They start in four or five days at Phillips Exeter Academy for their summer program. So we're, we're reaching very high with these kids for them to be the next leaders. And time for Syrian refugee youth, we think of time in a very different way. So one boy named Ali told me last year, I'll never forget it, he said, four years for you is nothing, but four years for us is a lifetime. And we have every single, not even year, every single month that passes that we are not investing in Syrian refugee education is, is another step towards a lost generation. And about being disruptive, we were called that by the UN Foundation. I'm very proud of being called that in this um, aid world. Uh, but I wanted to just say that to people like Ruba and Muhammad and Aram, Syria is very personal to us. But Syria is a global crisis. And it matters to all of you. It is a reflection of our collective humanity in the 21st century. This is basically how we're going to be judged in the future, by this crisis. So we have a choice right now on what we want our legacy to be as collective humanity. So yes, we want to disrupt humanitarian aid. But isn't it time to disrupt war? Isn't it time to disrupt fear? Isn't it time to disrupt these things that are happening and help people build their futures, get them back home, and, and, and write a better future for our own sakes? Steve Ruba. Thank you. Ruba, yeah, we, 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 we talked in our previous panel uh, about um, how, how you have a lot of uh, donor organizations coming to you and to support program for women. And you were saying sometimes that's counterproductive. And I wonder if you could uh, uh, talk about that just a little bit briefly before we move that's on to the perfect. next question. The Muslim woman uh, against women empowerment. Mm -hmm. No, I'm just kidding. So basically, uh, my idea in my organization and the thing that I always repeat is that we have to look uh, at, uh, at aid in a comprehensive and in a holistic way. 
a lot of organizations focus on children. A lot of organizations focus on women, on men, etc. But if the child is going to school and he's hungry, he comes back home and his father doesn't have anything to do. The father is uh, taking out his frustration on his mother and his mother doesn't want him to do his homework. Instead, she wants him to go out and work. Then what have we really done? This is why in Sawa, the organization that I had, we look at, um, uh, at the work that we do in a very holistic way. We have programs that target every single person in the family. Um, I mean, if you're age 70 and above, that doesn't mean that you're going to sit in your tent and only receive. You're as much as a giver as anyone else in the community. Why don't you come to our school and talk to the children about the history of their world, so that when, of, of their country, so that when they're asked, where are you from, they won't say, I'm from Camp 309. They're actually from Hama, they're actually from Halab, they're actually from Damascus, and they need to know their histories. So we work with the community in a comprehensive way, but what's been happening is a lot of um, international organizations focus on one program and, and, and they, they go so hyped about it that they only fund it. For example, women empowerment programs. So we found all of the women in the camps receiving a lot of support, going out to work, receiving the income, which is shifting very quickly family dynamics that didn't used to exist before the war. Uh, in, in a patriarchal society. I agree we need to change these norms, but in a much uh, uh, bottom-up ways. So the man is sitting at home, uh, sitting with uh, 10 to 15 other people in, uh, in the tent, which means he doesn't even get intimacy time with his wife. He doesn't even have a job. And his wa woman, all of a sudden, is the woman who is earning the income. So this is actually, according to our experience, increasing gender-based violence. You want to empower the woman, great. Why don't you empower the men as well? This is uh, the point that I was making in one of the previous panels. Oh, thank you. So, uh, you know, the, the international community, in terms of its, of its attention and funding, um, you know, we, we tend to look at the here and the now. We're looking at the immediate situation. How do we provide uh, humanitarian relief? But, but we all know that this is a longer-term problem. We would all like, inshallah, that this, this be a, a resolved. Uh, but, but the reality is, is that this is going to be a conflict that's going to last longer, that rebuilding Syria is going to take a very long time. And so we're looking at a longer term displacement of people. How do we shift from sort of the immediate humanitarian relief to longer term sustainable future for, uh, for these people so that we don't have a whole lost generation, particularly of children? Yes. Uh, well, um, first of all, uh, let's kill the myth of the refugees and the camps. Um, only 10%, maybe 12% of the refugees in the Middle East, at least, live in camps. So they are, most of them living in the communities, actually putting a heavy burden on very weak infrastructure. So that's coming back to proper investment into infrastructure in, in the receiving communities, into service delivery. And, in fact, also into uh, maybe more modern ways of teaching and ed education, um, job creation. Coding was mentioned as one of the of the very important um, aspects in the Middle East, there's huge potential in that. Looking at camps, uh, we need to move out of that storage facility. The storage facility for people for 20 years, for 30 years, we're creating huge problems for the future of any of the countries, either the receiving countries or the countries of origin. So let's move forward, and if camps become unavoidable, let's develop them into settlements, into cities, whatever the duration of, uh, will be, but that investment is really worthwhile. Exile can actually be a chance for um, change, for progress, for learning new things you would never discover, in fact, in your, in your home communities. So exile is not only bad, let's make it a chance. Let's make it, in fact, the first stepping stone for, for the future. But get, let's get out of that immediate relief thinking after six months. Let's move into a totally different approach of investing in people, um, investing through the people, wherever they are, as part of the global mobility or as part of their communities back home. Let's invest into, into their countries of origin. And maybe if I may just make one point as well. We have also another myth. That's the return to the place of origin. That's, I, I have been growing up with this in, in the United Nations. People change so much that quite often, when they go back, they don't go back exactly where, what, where they were living before. So we need to look into that as well. There will be new forms of communities building up when, when they return. And there's so much we can do in preparing this and building an, a totally different capacity of, of those populations instead of treating them as commodities. Ruba? 
What was the question? Sorry. So longer term sustainability. How what, how do we pivot to to longer term I mean, support? I can't repeat this enough, but please involve the Syrian, talk to them, ask them, uh, put them around the table with you when you are setting your strategies. Um, think about uh, the youth who. Uh, in five or 10 years, when things calm down, because honestly, I'm so pessimistic at the moment, they want to go back to their country and build it. Um, recent statistics in, in Lebanon show that 65% of youth um, have thought about suicide of Syrian youth. That's a huge number. A lot of the Syrian youth are going on boats or going back to Syria to fight. So if we don't think about this long term, we are creating the terrorism that we fear. We have to think about this long term. We have to think about the long term solutions through education, vocational training. You know, it pains my heart that we have a, a, a lot of children in our schools and our schools go up to 13 years of age. And I look at them when they're, you know, uh, you know uh, uh, playing the music instruments or running in, in, you know, they're one of the most privileged children. But then I look at them and I remember that after 13 years old, they're going to be in, 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 in the streets, uh, you know, working or, or, or going to the fields uh, to do these small jobs. So, I mean, um, think about the youth, which is a, a population that no one is thinking about. Continue involving the Syrians in strategizing. And please do everything you can. We have a very, very powerful audience here. Let's do everything we can to solve the root cause of the problem. Because if we want to think long term, we need to stop the war. Shelling needs to stop uh, uh, displacing people, because this is the root cause of, of, of our problem today. So Lena, in addition to the question, um, if you could maybe also explain why you asked to have this book up here. Next to us. Um, so this book is a book that we produced, a group of um, four different Syrian Americans, and we did this in 2014. It's when we reached the, we reached the um, number of dead in Syria re had reached 100,000. And um, we, we, were, we saw basically, we realized if we had to read the names of, every, of the 100,000 people who were killed, it would take 72 hours. Whereas if I say 100,000 people killed in Syria, I can say that in three seconds. So we wanted to show basically visually the scale of the crisis. We read these names aloud in front of the White House on March 15, 2014 uh, for 72 hours straight. And I'm sorry to say that um, we would need more than four more books, three more books to complete the list. The list continues to grow every single day. The list, can, the, this book of our dead can, contains names of our family members, people that we met over the years through this um, conflict, people like Aram that, had not, that were, they were armed with nothing but a camera, people who marched the streets with a flag calling for dignity and freedom. These are the kinds of people with their families, with their children, with their loved ones. These are the people that are in this book. And if you would like to see the book after, it tells you the story, the, the, the people who have doubts about what happened in Syria, you can tell the truth through the methods of how they died. They start with, with bullets. People were hit with bullets in protests. And then you begin to see shelling, and then you begin to see torture, and then you begin to see, when we get to 2013, you'll have pages of the chemical weapons victims. So if you have doubts about what's happening in Syria, you can look through how people have been killed over the past five and a half years. And um, I just want to say, in terms of long term, I'm American. I was born here. I lived half my life here, half my life in Syria. This um, being American is something very, very special. And I, I'm afraid that we're losing values and meanings of what it truly means to be American, which is to welcome, to welcome others. Um, since two, 2001, the United States has accepted over 790,000 refugees from around the world. How many of these refugees were linked to terrorism? Is there any guess here? Zero. Refugees are not related to terrorism. Refugees are fleeing terror. They're looking for a safe haven. I, I'm ashamed that our country has only accepted 2,800 refugees out of 5 million Syrian refugees. 
they go through the most extensive resettlement process out of any other refugee in the world. I think it's time to open our borders, to accept more Syrian refugees, to give people a chance for this long-term solution because we won't have a chance with Syria without a very strong next generation. And I, I can't think of a better place for them to come than the United States to have this kind of opportunity that we all had as immigrants and people who, who built this country together. Thank you. So we're going to move on to our final panel. Uh, and, and sort of as we um, make way to, for a discussion on, on the broader policy, and hopefully we will get to some of these issues on, on how we stop the war. Um, in addition to, to David Ignatius and, and Mohammed Ghanem, uh, who's coming back up, um, I'd like to introduce my, my good friend, uh, Fred Hoff. Ambassador Hoff, uh, I had the pleasure of working with, uh, now unfortunately 16 years ago, on the Sharm el-Sheikh Fact-Finding Committee. But he has today gone on to bigger and better things. He is now the director of the Atlantic Council's Rafiq uh, Hariri Center for the Middle East. He joined the Atlantic Council after a career as a U.S. Army officer, private sector CEO, and U.S. Department of State diplomat, where he took the lead in mediating Syrian-Israeli peace uh, efforts. So, welcome. This last part of our deep dive on Syria is meant to examine uh, what should be done. What are the steps that U.S. policy can, can take? Uh, we'll be talking, I think, for many years about how, how these events happened. That's not our subject here. We want to focus on what can be done in the remainder of President Obama's administration uh, and what can be done by the next president. Uh, Mohammed and, and, and Fred have been introduced to you. I just want to add one thing about Fred. In his position at the Atlantic Council, he has been, more than anyone I know, the conscience for former Foreign Service officers, people who care deeply about this problem, who served in the U.S. government. Uh, if you read a compendium of uh, Fred's writings on this, um, they're, they're painful, each one of them, because they're so focused. Fred saw this coming a long time ago, and he's consistently uh, warned about its consequences. Fred, I want to be begin with you with a question on what to do. And I want to start with the uh, unusual um, uh, courageous uh, statement by 51 of your former State Department officers who in the dissent channel, as it's called, uh, filed uh, their protest against the current uh, configuration of, of U.S. policy. Fred wrote a statement because many of these people look to Fred Hoff uh, as their kind of uh, beacon. Fred wrote a statement saying, Americans, however, sh despite all the disasters, should be proud that serving officials have protested a morally vacuous and politically bankrupt policy and have done so in the proper way through the designate, designated channel. So Fred, uh, the basic thrust of the 51 officers' recommendations was that the U.S. needs more military leverage mm -hmm. to be able to make the diplomacy that Secretary Kerry is committed to work. Explain to us how, how, that, might, how that might proceed, what, what that leverage might mean, what difference it might make on the ground and in Geneva at the negotiations. Sure, thanks, David. I, I think, first, first of all, it's important to understand what these, what these 51, this combination of foreign service officers and civil servants, what they were actually saying. They were, they were not calling for the invasion and occupation of Syria. They were not calling for violent regime change in Syria. They were not calling for a strategic bombing campaign in Syria. What they were trying to address was, was one central fact that I think we really, we really heard in the, previous, in the previous groups today. The Syrian regime of Bashar al-Assad for over five and a half years has been pursuing a survival strategy based on collective punishment and mass homicide. It is literally paying no price for this strategy. No price. Maybe aviation fuel, but even that's probably subsidized by Iran. What these officers are saying is, unless there is some price paid here, the mass homicide is going to continue, 
Syria will continue to empty itself, and there is going to be no prospect of peace negotiations. We're going to be hearing later from uh, Secretary of State Kerry. This guy has an impossible job. He has absolutely no leverage. He's got a smile and a shoe shine, basically, and he's trying to convince the Russians and the Iranians to lean on their client to do the right thing. Now, these folks have come up with one answer, uh, basically cruise missiles against regime helicopter bases when they go up to attack civilians. That may be the answer. I'm not sure. I was once a military professional. I think what's needed here is for the President of the United States to turn to his Secretary of Defense and say, look, Ash, we can't protect everyone in all places, but there's got to be a way to make this guy pay a price. Can you please give me some options? Cruise missiles may be on the menu. I don't know. But the key thing is a statement of intent by the American commander in chief to his secretary of defense. That's what's been lacking. So Fred, let me just uh, push back. If President Obama or, or one of his advisors uh, were here, they would say uh, it's, it's fine to talk about, about military leverage, but one thing we've learned as a country is this is a slippery slope. And what begins with a limited policy uh, quickly becomes something more than that. And we've seen President Obama is, uh, has, has spoken to his military commanders, and he's asked them, can you assure me that if we start this, it won't end up in something much bigger that, so how would you answer that question, which I know uh, President Obama, uh, anybody in the White House would, would want to put to you? It's a, legit, it's a legitimate question. I mean, what we know five and a half years into this crisis is that there are no silver bullets for Syria. This is the quintessential problem from hell. And given where we are now five and a half years into this, our choices are basically between, between bad and worse. What I would urge, though, and I think what the President realizes, is that, is, that, is that risk does not only attach to limited military strikes. Risk attaches to the way we've pursued this policy for the past five and a half years. If, if somebody, if, if I had had the foresight to tell President Obama in late 2011 that here is where we would be in 2016 if you do the following actions, the red line and all, and all, this, all this business, surely he would say, oh no, that would, be, that would be a reckless policy. We can't go down that road. I mean, look at the implications. If it's not bad enough for the people of Syria, their neighbors, look, look at what's happening in, in Europe. Can we really dismiss the possibility that the Syrian crisis has had a major impact on the recent vote in the United Kingdom. You know, to the extent that immigration weighed on the minds, migrants weighed on the minds of people who were voting, well, what's the main source of this? It's the crisis in Syria. So if we're gonna look at, if we're gonna look at risk, we, we ought to look at the, the, the risks attached to the way we pursued this so far leaving civilians on the bullseye, leaving Bashar al-Assad perfectly free to do what he wishes to civilians when he chooses to do it. I, uh, Iraq, I think, taught uh, everyone in this room, taught the whole country the dangers of military intervention. This story that we've been listening to uh, from each of the participants has taught us all the dangers of not intervening, what the right policy is, uh, is is somewhere in between. Mohammed, I want to turn to you and ask you about what the president has been trying to do. Uh, last February 28, uh, Secretary Kerry announced with uh, 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 Minister Lavrov uh, a process leading to, uh, it was argued, cessation of hostilities. Uh, the negotiations, the conversations will be centered in, in Geneva. And I want you to uh, Explain to this audience why that process, why that effort to seek a diplomatic solution, a reduction in violence, seems to be failing. What's going wrong, what's going wrong with it? 
and what could be done to make that work better? Okay, thank you, thank you so much, uh, David. First off, I would like to thank the um, Aspen Institute for putting on this really impressive event in this uh, lovely town. Um, I, and, a, and a special shout out to actually Libby and uh, Peter for working with us to, to make this happen. Thank you so much. It's also a special honor to share the panel with uh, Ambassador uh, uh, Frederick uh, Hoff because I can tell you as a Syrian who lived in Syria for three decades and as a Syrian who's quite often not very pleased with the renditions or the perceptions of Washington DC pundits of my country that I can say with full confidence that this man sitting next to me is the American who understands Syria the best. So if you're looking for sound analysis or sound recommendations, here's your man, please follow uh, his, his, his writings. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, I hear there's a new administration coming in. Maybe you can <laughs> circulate your resume. So what happened, uh, what happened and, I, and I definitely hope that uh, he, he, he will be joining if this new administration uh, is, uh, is willing to, to change things. Now, uh, to, to your question, um, the, about a year and a half ago, uh, we had a um, meeting at the, at the White House, and it was with uh, senior officials. We realized that the administration had made the decision, although that was not communicated at the meeting, but we uh, were able to you know, read between the lines. We realized that the administration had made the decision that for the remainder of Mr. Obama's second term, they were mainly going to focus on uh, what, what they called violence reduction measures. Uh, so that's why they, they pursued a cessation of hostilities or a ceasefire uh, in, in Syria. And that they pretty much, although they didn't say that uh, explicitly, they pretty much uh, had given up uh, hope on an actual political track and transition in Syria. Of course, this was not communicated publicly. What was communicated publicly was that they were pursuing a diplomatic track, they were serious about the transition, and they, they wanted the cessation of hostilities. They went into uh, talks with, with the Russians uh, with no leverage. Uh, the Russians maximized their leverage before they went into talks in September 30th, 2015. They intervened in Syria. They, they started a bombing campaign against the Syrian opposition. So they had a lot of leverage. The American side had, had no leverage. So uh, fast forward to 2016, what actually transpired in Geneva, where you had this unit uh, that monitored, Russian American unit that monitored uh, violations of the cessation of hostilities. What actually was, was going on there is basically them meeting uh, and you know, the American side would present daily violations and the, and the Russians would, would deny that those violations happened or would say it was not the Assad regime or it was Nusra. Um, and uh, there was no enforcement mechanism. And like, uh, uh, as, as Fred Hoff said, uh, Secretary Kerry, all the Secretary Kerry could do was you know, pick up the phone and, and speak with Lavrov and, and, and say, you know, this is, you know, we, we, like we should, we should know better, it shouldn't be the case, we should, uh, this is not in the best interest of Russia. Uh, so those powers of persuasion uh, were insufficient, and because of that, this cessation of hostilities has actually collapsed because the regime was able to violate it at will. No enforcement mechanism, no monitors on the ground. And uh, then a, uh, the Syrian Al-Qaeda uh, affiliate, Jabhat Nusra, that was not party to the ceasefire or the cessation of hostilities, after a month and about 45 days of continued violations at will by the regime and the Russians, they were able to convince others to you know, launch a counterattack, and the ceasefire collapsed. And uh, they were only able to galvanize support when those violations occurred and there were no uh, consequences. So I think what should happen, what the, the next administration uh, uh, should do, is that they should definitely heed the, the calls of those 51 diplomats who all worked on Syria in different capacities at the State Department, and they should introduce what has uh, hitherto been missing in, in US policy towards Syria, which is consequences for failing to comply with serious diplomatic efforts. Otherwise, we're not gonna get anywhere. So Fred, it's amazing uh, to think that it was less than a year ago that Russia intervened militarily. R Russia's become such a dominant fact on the ground now. Uh, in some ways, uh, uh, Russia has taught us a lesson in what the ruthless use of power uh, is about. You know, you've studied Syria, you've lived there, uh, you know it intimately. What difference uh, is this larger Russian uh, role, this decisive Russian presence, 
going to make in terms of the, of the future of that country and indeed the, the region. Are, are the Russians in the Middle East now in a, in a more serious way uh, to stay? Uh, I think uh, I think they are, and I think I, I think a lot of this uh, a lot of this goes to uh, President Putin's personal analysis uh, of what it's going to take for him uh, to stay in power indefinitely in Russia. Uh, what Putin has been telling his own people, and what he told the UN General Assembly uh, last September, just before intervening, is that his agenda is to defeat the so-called American regime change and democratization agenda in the Middle East. And where he intends to defeat it is in Syria. Uh, so Russia intervened uh, last September when, uh, when its client, Bashar al-Assad, was having some military problems. They've reversed all that. Uh, they're on the verge now of besieging the city of Aleppo causing more and more refugees to get on the road and uh, race in the direction of Turkey and perhaps ultimately in the, in the direction, of, uh, direction of Europe. Look, there, there, are, there, are no, there are no easy answers to this. Certainly, we shouldn't be looking for a military confrontation with Russia over Syria. I don't think there's anyone in this room, starting with me, who has a detailed idea of what the Syria of the future should look like and how to get there. But I think I know one thing for sure. As long as civilians are on the bullseye, as long as civilians are on the bullseye, nothing good can happen, period. If John Kerry can convince his Russian and Iranian counterparts to get their guy out of this filthy business, good. There's no limit to the thanks that John Kerry, operating with zero leverage, would deserve if he could pull off something as monumental as this. Uh, we wish him well, uh, but it's going to be extraordinarily difficult for him to do this. But with civilians on the bullseye, and Bashar al-Assad is not the only criminal element here. He is the predominant one, for sure. We've got ISIS in the east of Syria. We've got the Nusra Front. We've got a variety of people who really live on targeting civilians. As long as this is the prevailing way of doing politics and war in Syria, Literally, nothing good can happen. And this country, originally 23 million people when this conflict started, this country will continue to empty itself. And Turkey is not going to be able to contain it all. Fred, a, a, a small uh, focused uh, question. Talking yesterday with a senior US military commander uh, back in Washington, uh, he expressed uh, concern about what the United States uh, would or should do if Russia decides it wants to join in the final assault on Raqqa, the capital of the Islamic State. Russia has mostly operated in the West, uh, but it did move with the Syrian forces to yeah. uh, free uh, Tadmor, Palmyra, the beautiful uh, ruins of Palmyra. What if Russia says it wants a piece of the action in Raqqa? Should the United States invite them in and make that a joint effort, or should we say no? How's that going to work? I, uh, I'm, I'm surprised the Russians have really not moved in this, uh, in this direction yet. Russia entered Syria the last day of September 2015, saying it was coming in to fight ISIS. Very little of the Russian effort has been against ISIS to date. It's been predominantly against the real enemy, the Syrian nationalist enemies of Bashar al-Assad. But Russia's objective here, what Putin wants to be able to tell his people is, at the end of the day, I got President Barack Obama, or Obama's successor, to shake hands with Bashar al-Assad and work with Assad to defeat ISIS. This, for Vladimir Putin, this is the ultimate diplomatic brass ring. 
this is everything. I'm surprised, frankly, uh, that the Russians haven't told their Iranian allies and the regime, okay, enough of this Aleppo business. Let's, let's move in the direction of Raqqa and see if we can put the United States in a real corner here. Because what would we do? We in our 66 member coalition, are we going to simply disappear from the fight? Are we going to tell the Russians and the others we'll go ahead and go ahead and have a nice day? Uh, you know, to me, to me, this 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 is one of the reasons why I've been I've been recommending that in addition to trying to protect civilians from Assad, we speed up the timetable against ISIS in eastern Syria. The operations in Paris and Brussels were both planned in Raqqa, the ISIS capital in Syria. How lucky do we think we are? How much time do we think we have? Is it going to take something parallel happening in Lincoln, Nebraska, for us to finally realize that we, we really need to put together a coalition of the willing so that we can have an effective ground force in eastern Syria, which is what we've lacked. We've basically been relying on a Kurdish militia. And, and that, really, that really has its limits. So I would, be, I would be looking for the Russians, perhaps, to try to put us in a corner there. One um, uh, point, uh, just to, in fairness to, to the uh, president, uh, one key corridor through which the foreign fighters have moved in and out is a town called Munbij, just uh, west of the Euphrates River. Uh, we have been asking Turkey to close that area for two years, and Turkey's done nothing. And the president finally said, uh, look, if you won't do it, we're going to do it. And so uh, in the last uh, three weeks, the United States, with its proxies, has gone in uh, with both feet. And uh, from everything I know, Fred would know better. Uh, that operation has gone surprisingly well, and Munbij is essentially is surrounded. Well. So that uh, uh, transit <laughs> point for people who'd love to uh, come to the West and commit terrorist acts is, is, is being closed. Um, Mohammed, I, I want to uh, turn to this question about, about the future. As Fred said, no one can say with confidence what uh, Syria will, will look like. But one thing that worries observers like me is the difficulty the opposition has had in getting together. The opposition is so often uh, quarreling amongst itself. I was just in northern Syria uh, with the Kurdish fighters, and they tell, tell me, we're fighting for a place called Rojava, our ancestral Kurdish homeland. You talk to Syrian Arabs, and they say, we're fighting for a place called Syria. Well, you know, we don't want to. So how can those uh, sharply divided uh, parts of the opposition, all fighting uh, Assad, how can they be brought together? Okay, uh, it's, it's actually a very uh, important question, but I, I'm going to be brutally uh, objective and brutally honest with, with you here. I don't think that any analyst would uh, be able to say that YPG militias that are... This is are, the Syrian Kurdish militia that's doing the bulk and of the And it's just one, one they, there's just one Kurdish faction that actually doesn't get along with other Kurdish factions. Uh, they are not opposed to the Assad regime, and I think there's preponderance of evidence. So you can't really, we can't really call them uh, uh, opposition. Now, are they part of the country? Of course. Are they a key part of the country? Of course. Are you going to have to reconcile them with the rest of the country? Of course. How do you do that? Now, let me start with that piece. So the U.S. does extend substantial support to uh, the, the Kurdish YPG militias. Unfortunately, no conditionality has been introduced uh, when that aid was extended. What does that mean? Uh, first of all, the, the, the YPG militias has refused to uh, allow other Kurdish factions who are opposed to both Assad and, and ISIS to operate freely in their areas. So you have to say, well, this is, this is not okay. Uh, you cannot crack down on dissent in areas you control, number one. Number two, Amnesty International accused them of uh, committing ethnic cleansing against uh, you know, some Arab, commu Arab communities in areas they control. So you also have to say, we can continue to support you so long as you, as you do that. So you have leverage over them. You have to use that, that leverage to, to shepherd them into, uh, in, a, in a more uh, positive direction. 
Now, as far as the, the opposition is, is concerned, the story of the opposition is really uh, an interesting one. Um, I've, I've, worked with, uh, I've worked with them since, uh, uh, since the beginning. And yes, they quarreled amongst themselves, etc. but there were key moments uh, where they were trying to make a key difference in the country and no support whatsoever was extended to them. Uh, f f um, uh, l let me give you one such example. In 2014, we received uh, requests from rebels uh, opposed to Assad for uh, a nationalist Syria, for a pro-democracy Syria in Eastern Syria uh, for help because they were actually locked in a, in a bitter fight with ISIS in Eastern Syria. And they said, we are really concerned that ISIS is going to conquer all of Eastern Syria and then hop across the border, uh, barrel across the border into Iraq and then come back and finish their conquest of Syria. I went to the White House, I met with senior officials on the National Security Council and I relayed those requests. Nothing happened and then what happened uh, in after that? Some of, the, some of my interlocutors were actually killed by ISIS. Their bodies were floating down the Euphrates River. ISIS did conquer Eastern Syria. They captured Mosul. They came back and they became the global menace that ISIS is right now. Early 2014, the, the moderate opposition, whether they were quarreling, um, quarreling amongst themselves or not, also launched uh, 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 um, fierce battles against, uh, uh, against ISIS before there was even an international coalition uh, against ISIS. They pleaded with the international community for support. No support came. As a result, um, you know, ISIS was, uh, uh, was able to, to uh, uh, exert more control in Syria. So what the, what the opposition doesn't have right now is what we're actually extending to uh, Kurdish YPG militias. You need to help them establish an effective command and control structure, uh, uh, an operations room where assistance is consistent because this has not been the case. Actually, the U.S. outsourced uh, arming the, the, the moderate Syrian opposition to Qatar, to Saudi Arabia, to other countries, and those countries had competing agendas. Saudi wanted to work with so-and-so group, and Qatar wanted to work with this and that group, and those groups eventually uh, you know, uh, didn't always see eye to eye with each other because they, uh, they had backers. And I can tell you, with, uh, you know, in 2014, 13 and 14, we had to mediate uh, sometimes because Saudi would extend support to some groups and say, you know, on the condition that you, uh, you know, can't work with groups supported by Qatar. And Qatar is the same. It was a mess. So that, that it didn't need to get to that, but it got, got to that because the, the approach that we've pursued to Syria, the Obama administration has pursued so far, has been one of containment and of trying to do the bare minimum uh, with regards to the situation. And this has really, and again, objectively failed spectacularly. It was based on a genuine desire, especially after the Iraq war and the Afghanistan war, to avoid foreign wars, focus on economic resources at home, uh, focus on, uh, look, look inward, uh, and avoid those slippery slopes. But I think five and a half years uh, into the conflict in Syria, we have learned the hard way that in an interconnected, globalized war, you can actually cauterize the wound in Syria and contain the effects within Syria's borders. Syria's neighbors suffered, and now we saw a key EU member indirectly leaving the EU, uh, indirectly because of the refugee crisis that Syria is the main uh, contributor to. So the policy that we've pursued over the past five and a half, half years has not worked objectively. Rise of ISIS, Brexit, refugee crisis, re global reverberations. We actually had to intervene. We're paying up billions of dollars to finance the war against ISIS. We have resurgence of Al-Qaeda in Syria, and there's the risk of leaving Al-Qaeda in control of a, a, a much more sophisticated Al-Qaeda in control of an entire country with a more legitimate cause because they're trying to, uh, trying to market themselves in Syria as the group that is effective on the battlefield and that is standing up to the Assad regime when the entire world has turned a blind eye to all these massacres against civilians. This is extremely dangerous. Whether you turn the country over to Hezbollah in Iran, they've killed Americans before, or if, whether you've turned it, to turn it over to ISIS and Assad, this, is also, this, this end game is untenable for the United States, it's untenable for civilians in Syria. And what we need to do is to realize that containment is a myth. It's not working. And we need to introduce, employ a new strategy 
that takes into consideration that in the, in the 21st century, you cannot allow civilians to be slaughtered on a large scale and spare yourself the consequences, is going to come back to haunt you. So, so I, I want to ask uh, Fred for a, a brief uh, last word, because our, our, our time uh, basically has is, is ex expired. And uh, Fred, I, I guess what I'd put to you uh, is I sometimes think uh, that we need a 1944 moment. Uh, in 1944, before World War II was over, Franklin Roosevelt began thinking seriously about how to govern the world after the war ended. Mm. How, you know, and, and so in 1944, the IMF, the World Bank, the Atlantic Charter, the framework for the United Nations, all began to be drafted with, with still a year of fighting left. Do you have any brief thoughts, if we were to have a 1944 moment together, here in Aspen, what, what, would you, what would you put into that bag? Well, for, uh, first of all, I'm happy to say that 1944 is even before my time. <laughs> That's, uh, um, you know, as it, as it happens, at least in the context of Middle East, North Africa, this is something that, uh, that my organization, the Atlantic Council, is very much looking into now. We have something called the Middle East Strategy Task Force, and I would, I would urge everyone here to, to keep an eye on the deliberations of this body. We have, uh, we have uh, Madeleine Albright. You've rounded up many and, former. Uh, yeah, uh, we, have, we have, we have, we, we, we have, and, and Steve Hadley, basically. This is, a, this is a bipartisan, a bipartisan effort to try to define what is it exactly that's happening in the Middle East that has caused this international crisis and how, how can we in the West, and because we're the Atlantic Council, it's the transatlantic community, how can we at least on the margins try to make some of this turn out right? What we have from one end of Middle East, North Africa to the other is a crisis in governing legitimacy. If you look at the different countries of the Middle East, how many can you actually point to where there is within country X virtually unanimous consensus on the rules of the political game. All right, some people may make an argument for Morocco, some for Jordan, but, but in general, what we're facing is a breakdown in political legitimacy. The, the question for most of these countries is what really follows the Ottoman Sultan? as the source of political legitimacy. So we're, we're, looking into, uh, we're looking into ways and means where the West, where the transatlantic community can be helpful through education, through mostly, mostly soft power, uh, in helping the states of this region uh, come up with the right answers to end these civil wars and actually, uh, actually get their countries going on the right path. I don't know that it's a 1944 moment, but, uh, but at least we're trying. So when I listen to people like Mohammed Ghanem and, and, and Fred Hoff, I know ju just how serious this problem is. Also, I know what good policy would look like. So thank you very much. Thank you.